and hello, welcome, good evening, greetings. Uh, can start saying it in different languages. Um, I will say this much. Tonight is going to be different than many other nights. And there's Leonard. <laughs> Greetings. And I want to thank people that are going to be tuning in via Twitter because I know uh, it's been retweeted a little bit. I, I did some excessive tweeting today. Uh, and the reason is we're going to be figuring out some things tonight. And that's why I called this an exegetical intercalation. How about that for a good name for a jazz instrumental piece? Which by the way, unfortunately, it looks like I have to put my recording project on hold at this time due to uh, whatever you wanna call it, uh, the expression unforeseen circumstances. Oh, and I'm sorry, I gotta add this in because this is always fun and nice. I didn't put in the, the good evening and the happy Monday. And uh, yeah, how about that for uh, a, a time? What meaneth this? Answer, Leviticus 26 and some other ideas. Uh, normally on Monday night, we are in this, uh, let me get this. I just nailed a bug <laughs> as I grabbed our text that we have been in. And this one's actually the old version. Can you tell? Oh, wow. The new version is not too much different. But guess what? Tonight, unfortunately, um, due to the unforeseen circumstances that I just mentioned, we are going to have to uh, try to see what all I've got here. Yeah, we're going to have to work on a little bit of understanding and it's not of our text and our usual stuff such as the heathenism text that we're in that you can get from rb theme junior bible ministries at no charge and here's the contact info i'll put that up for a minute while i'm talking and what is this um this is like it says above there uh, God commands the Christian to be inwardly transformed. This transformation requires renewing the mind daily through learning and applying Bible doctrine. And if you think that's true, contact them at any one of those, either address, phone number, or website, uh, you know, locations. And you can get this catalog and everything that they have, 11,000 hours or more of video and audio content, um, somewhere between 70 and 100 books. I don't even know at this point. Um, and MP3 CDs, et cetera, et cetera. All right, so hopefully somebody was able to jot all that information down or get a snapshot, uh, screenshot, whatever. Here's the deal, okay? When people try to figure out what's going on in the world. And especially from any vantage point, you end up with any kind of interpretation of what the heck is going on. What I try to do on Monday nights, especially, but also on Wednesday, I'm trying to bring it together somehow. Um, Cause on Wednesdays we are actually exegeting a biblical text it's Philemon, and we're almost done. And due to the, let's call it upcoming exigencies, the things that are going on, and I know, unfortunately, and I, I put it on a tweet, so for those who don't get Twitter, I'm actually going to show it. Uh, this is the one that I tweeted here. Let's see if we can see it, and I can read it, and we can kind of put it together there. It's sad to know only a few will get to see the real significance and understand all this, uh, what is really going on, and what it means for us here and all around the globe. It's absolutely fascinating. We're living through it. Well, maybe. Some have already died and more soon. 
All right, so why did I put that up? And again, part of the board here, what meaneth this? Well, here's the answer to all that. Um, there is truth and reality. And it's actually not quite as abundant and available as a lot of other junk. And what we're going to see tonight is Leviticus 26, where you're going to see yourself. You're going to see the time in which you live. You're going to see the circumstances that are going on, but you're going to see it in a way that if you've read Leviticus 26 before, you've never seen it before. Why? Because what I'm going to do is read between the lines and explain a couple of things. I wish I could do a lot more, but if you can imagine, Leviticus 26 has uh, 46 verses, and we've spent the past almost, let's see, when would it be? Two and a half years, I guess. Uh, we start in May, so it's getting close to two and a half years on 22 or 25 verses over in the New Testament. And let me tell you, with the Old Testament, it would take longer verse by verse because there's a lot more to Old Testament exegesis. So what I'm going to do now to get us ready is what I always do in the preliminaries. And then you're going to find out why everything is happening the way it is and what it is and what's going to happen next. Because we're not in the fifth cycle of discipline. And Leviticus 26 goes through all five cycles. And you're going to see how much we actually are getting our hair singed on our heads, on our arms, on our legs, whatever, wherever there's hair. Um, and pretty soon, a lot of people are going to have uh, red fanny syndrome. And that's another good name for a song. That'd probably be good in a country song or maybe even the blues, you know. Um, in fact, the blues, that sounds pretty good. Red fanny syndrome. We could do something with that. And so here's the point. Notice I got a lot of red on the board here. Um, the point is we're about to really feel it. And I have a meeting tomorrow with an important person, a VIP, as they say. And um, I, it's a half hour meeting. And I, I, it's at 2 p.m. my time here in Arizona, which is the same as California. Let's call it Pacific Daylight Time. It's also Mountain Standard Time because we don't change time. But whatever time that means for you, uh, I would appreciate your prayers that things go well because they could go very well and they could be a very big influence, not just on the county and the state of Arizona, the Yavapai County. But um, uh, as you already know, Arizona is uh, in the middle of a, a very interesting quagmire politically. And it's having impact on the entire country. And there's a lot of money being put into it. And I will use the big B word. It's about a billion dollars being put into it uh, in the fight. And, and that's just on one side. You can guess what that is. But we're not going to talk about that. We're going to talk about solutions that are the real solution. And so if you're kind of new here, you're going to say, ah, I have not heard about this kind of stuff before. And I'm giving you right now the caveat, letting you know that's true. And I'm going to tell you why. Why? It's because exegesis is not commonly done in the land. So how can you get an exegetical intercalation? Um, I guess I'm going to need to explain that. Like it says, what meaneth this? And answer, we're going to see the details of it in Leviticus 26. Now, to show you something different that almost means something, you know, people can read uh, the Latin letters, meaning originating from the Latin language. So Lord Jesus Christ is okay. But once you translate into Greek letters, Kuriasi Jesus Christos, which you can see what it looks like in Greek and then below it, English letters or Latin 
alphabet. And then you go to even older texts where you read right to left and you see Adonai Yeshua HaMashiach in Hebrew. Well, that may be a bunch of gibberish and mean nothing to most people who just saw this. But to some people, it means something. And to a smaller group of people, it means a lot. And to a very small number of people, it is absolutely definitive of that old, uh, there was a book by an author, Indian guy, meaning from India, uh, and it was, his name was Baba Ram Das. And the book was called Be Here Now. And it was kind of a bluish purple square book. It said, be here now, be here now, be here now in a circle. And to some people, that little board there has a lot to do with be here now. And it also has to do with be here in eternity past. Let me see if I can get my fingers uh, on the board. See, how do I do that? Which way do I want to go? This way. Yeah. Eternity past. And then I said, be here now. And then be here in eternity. Be here in the future. And... I wanted to show a couple of books. Sorry that I can't get into the details of it all, but there's a book by one of my professors, uh, Dr. Leitner, called The Last Days Handbook, Comprehensive Guide to Understanding Different Views of Prophecy, Who Believes What About Prophecy and Why. And then, um, and that's a very interesting book. There's another interesting one by, there's a Ryrie Bible, because Charles Ryrie did his own, uh, you know, uh, well, whatever you want to call it, a version of the Bible, the Ryrie Study Bible. And this book, a st study or survey of Bible doctrine. And then another guy that I didn't ever get, I, I guess I had him as uh, a guest speaker and that type of thing. Never had a class with him because he was already uh, the chancellor of Dallas Theological Seminary. And he was the second president of Dallas Seminary after Lewis Sperry Chafer. Um, and then the third one was Dr. Donald Campbell. And I started there under Dr. Campbell. And then the fourth one was there. Most of the time I was there was Chuck Swindoll. And then the fifth one just retired this year. Um, uh, what's his first name? Mark, I think. Baker. I hope I got that right. I, I, it, I'm blank on being sure if I've got his name right. Uh, something rings wrong about that. Mark Bailey, Dr. Bailey. See, I knew something was wrong there. Um, and uh, Mark Bailey was the fifth, and there's now a sixth president at Dallas Seminary. But anyway, Dr. Walverd, I think there's a picture of him here in the back. And gosh, this guy was like six, nine or something. He missed his calling, could have been a basketball player. Um, Dr. Walverd was an astounding and astute professor, uh, one of the really good ones at Dallas Seminary. And so this little handbook, it's about as big as a Bible, uh, very interesting book, very cheap too. How, how the heck was I getting this book for $15? That's amazing because this is really a, an excellent reference work. Um, the reason I bring up these books is there are a lot of books and a lot of classes and a lot of languages and a lot of theology and a lot, a lot of stuff that people have no idea about or that I studied it. Um, every so often I mentioned that I've had the equivalent of two doctorates. Okay. Why? Because when you study theology, you have to learn languages. So if you get a master of theology, you can't even get that until you've studied and really gotten comfortable with a bunch of language issues like Greek and Hebrew and their uh, relatives, their cognate languages, so that you can read the Bible. But then you also have to get not only languages, but theology. And then not only that, but you get all this other stuff like church history. And, and then if you're dealing in, in my case, it was academic ministries in Old Testament. You get all kinds of weird special classes about all that stuff. And the reason I'm bringing all this back up is exegesis is pulling out from what's in the text. 
Now, our text is the Bible. And as you know, Bibles, regular, uh, what we would call evangelical Bibles, it just looked like a big fat book and say, you know, in this case, for example, the new Schofield, that was um, uh, C.I. Schofield, who was an attorney, by the way. And he ended up getting real serious about theology. And so he had a study Bible. And here it's a new American Standard uh, translation version with the uh, study notes from this famous guy, C.I. Schofield. We have this other big fat Bible that some of us have, the NET Bible, Full Notes Edition. And like I said, these books are very intense and extensive. There's a lot going on. So I, I'm going to have to break into uh, prayer mode here for a second to get us ready so that anything else that I say, we make sure that I'm saying it right, that I'm in fellowship. That's why we have a moment of silent prayer so that you can rebound if necessary for those of you who know what that means. Um, and I will put this much on the board, I mean, or show you this chart, which can call it a board, explains a little bit that we got to have a moment of silent prayer. If you are not a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, do not have a personal relationship with the God of the universe and wonder if there even is one. Um, I'm going to explain things like exegetical intercalation and, and many other things, and we're going to read through a whole chapter that explains why we're having this problem in the world right now uh, called World War III. And, you know, it. I was one of the first people to say that, but now it's a common phrase that people use on all kinds of, you know, cable and network channels. I, I hear it from all kinds of people. So it's not my idea, but I certainly was one of the early expounders and, uh, you know, uh, what would you call it, proponents to explain that that was going on. So we're going to have a moment of silent prayer. Like I said, if you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, that the Bible says he is, Acts 16, 31 is a place where it says it. And if you don't know the Bible, you can go look that up later. Um, there are a whole bunch of verses. Uh, John 3, 16, that's a big one. John 3, 36 is another one. And then I've got a couple others on my other board, like uh, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and um, Acts 4, 12. You know, I can talk about the Bible a little bit, but what I really want to do is explain what's going on and show you what it says in the scriptures and to have that be our foundation and documentation and justification that explains why what I'm saying is both true and correct, the way a good doctor should. Which, by the way, a doctor originally, if it wasn't an MD, means a teacher. So uh, MDs, notice they're a doctor, but they're also an MD, a medical doctor. So they wax eloquent on medicine. But a theological doctor waxes eloquent on theology. And, uh, you know, uh, somebody who has a doctorate in business waxes eloquent in business. And uh, there are political science doctors. They're supposed to understand politics and the science of politics and all that stuff. Well, we're going to see a little bit of this from a biblical perspective, and that's what's exciting because you're going to see truth. And it's kind of scary. If you have a Bible and you go right now to Leviticus 26, you'll see why. But wait until we get into the details, and then you'll uh, come out of this in about another hour because I'm only going to go for about another hour and five minutes or something like that. We'll see if I can pull that off. That's my goal. So we can end in a little more than an hour, hour and 10 minutes. All right, so anyway, let's have a moment now of silent prayer. Like I said, if you have never uh, put your faith in Christ where you don't have a relationship with the God of the universe because you don't know if he's even real, that's how you do it. So you just come to the foot of the cross, as we say in expression, and say, God, I don't even know if you're real. Uh, if it says in the Bible that we're supposed to believe in Jesus Christ, that he died on the cross for the sins of the world, and that's for everyone of us individually because none of us is perfect. Every person is a sinner since Adam, the first person. He wasn't a sinner originally. And then the only person that's the exception is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why he had to go and die on the cross for the sins of the world. He had to be sinless. 
to be a substitute. Okay, just a bunch of long stories. Uh, at the moment of faith, you are placed into union with Christ or Mashiach as the Hebrew uh, version of Christ or Christos in Greek. Christos, Mashiach means anointed one. You get put into union with him forever and ever and ever. You're also filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, you have God in you. That's God with us. Uh, Im anu el. So you get Emmanuel. See, all this stuff comes from somewhere. And the bottom line is, at that moment, you're good to go. But if you sin afterwards, and we all do, that's if first class condition, and it's true. So it's not if and the subjunctive or a plus the subjunctive in or aon in Hebrew. I mean, in Greek, it is uh, if and the indicative mood. That means you will do it. Not maybe you will, maybe you won't. That's third class condition. Now, again, remember when I said, I showed you a board that said, oh, if you don't understand some of this, hang in there. This might be one of those places where, you know, what's he talking about? Third class condition in the Greek and aeon and uh, uh, if uh, first class condition and it's true. Okay, those of you that haven't had all that, hang in there. Just trust me. We're gonna have a moment of silent prayer. Like I said, that's so that if you have sin as a believer and you're controlled by your old sin nature, you rebound through 1 John 1, 9 and you get back into fellowship. Those of you who are new to this game, meaning you're a believer as of prayer time here tonight, then you got nothing to worry about. You just uh, hang in there with us. Uh, the rest of us, we need uh, a moment of silent prayer to rebound if necessary. So uh, with that all explained and said, um, I would say without further adieu, let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, once again, it's a great privilege and honor and fun to know that we can come to your throne of grace through prayer and that we can begin a relationship with you if it's for the first time. And the angels cheer when that happens. That's what the scriptures teach. As well as uh, those of us who have had a relationship with you, make sure that we're in fellowship by a rebound technique and by naming our sins as per first john 1 9 if we name claim cite admit or acknowledge our sins you are faithful and just you're righteous and uh you cleanse us of our sins those are our known sins that we claim and even of all unrighteousness that includes unknown sins that we don't even know about you make it possible for us to have a relationship with you, be in fellowship with you, be empowered by God, the Holy Spirit, and be able to study spiritual, theological, biblical, exegetical, supernatural things. This is beyond awesome. Thank you for this privilege. We know that it's been made possible because the Lord Jesus Christ, your son, the unique person of the universe who came in hypostatic union, he was undiminished deity and true humanity in one person. And he lived a perfect sinless life for about 33 years, went to the cross and died for our sins. And it's on that basis that we're together with you right now. So we thank you for all these things. We ask them, B'Shem Yeshua HaMashiach, which is the Hebrew for saying uh, in his name, in Christ's name, B'Shem Yeshua, in the name of, the, uh, of Yeshua, meaning the anointed one. And that's where we get our uh, English word Christ. So, B'Shem Yeshua HaMashiach in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Well, that was a mouthful. I'm telling you, it's getting intense, isn't it? It's getting really wild and things are really moving. There's a lot going on and you really need to know. Oh, wow. I see uh, a comment from, oh yeah, I've seen uh, I know who you are because of the Matrix film. You're you're a divine Smith instead of a whatever you'd call that uh, the bad guys in in that movie. <laughs> so yeah. Oh, and then I like that. I'm back. <laughs> so uh, very good. All right. So check it out, folks. We are going to get into this, and we have an amen also from Leonard. And um, let's now start to look at these important details that are going to make sense, okay? Um, back to understanding what I wrote. 
When I said tonight, exegetical intercalation, yay, that's real easy to explain. Exegesis is where you pull out from what's there. So a lot of people can pull out of the Bible. You know, there's what that says that and they pull it out. The opposite of that is to read the Bible and put into it. That's called eisegesis. Um, and it's from the prepositions ex and or ek in Greek and eis in Greek. Not going to get into further detail on that stuff. Only to say that we're pulling out from what's there. Uh, and when I put here intercalation, guess what? Like a calendar. I'm putting into our calendar something that wasn't actually there. So we've added this in. So normally we're in our textbook on Monday night, which we will continue next week. Um, we also uh, spend a little time learning more about principles and practice of Greek exegesis. Tonight you're going to see I may pull a few things out of the hat um, that will be, let's call it, Hebrew exegesis. And, um, and so what I'm doing is I'm intercalating, I'm squeezing in, I'm adding into our normal uh, Monday night program, which would be the heathenism book and the other book, actually, yeah, both of them. I'm stopping for a minute and intercalating something exegetical. And they say, oh, here we go again. What's that word? Yeah, we're going to look at Leviticus 26, the entire chapter. You're going to find out about the five cycles of discipline, and you're going to see which cycles we're in and which cycles we've been in because they, uh, they build on top of each other. And we're going to see tonight, I have underlined wherever um, the phrase I will show you this uh, right in my Bible so you see it, where it says seven times more. Okay, there's going to be five of them coming up. Uh, the first one is in Leviticus 26, verse 18. And so I'm putting my finger on it here. So you can see where, see underlined seven times more for your sins. And that's in the second uh, cycle of discipline. Now, we're going to be reading through this, and I'll try to throw in some details. I have both the NASB, from which I will read, but I also have handy the NET, which starts with Leviticus 26 on page 264. And I know a few of you that may be watching have this version. Now, notice what it says, exhortation to obedience, and then the benefits of obedience. Now that's on page 264 and we're starting there at, at Leviticus 26. Now, before we do that, I have some notes here. I want to talk about a couple of things and then we're going to really do a deep dive and it's going to be pretty intense because I'm going through it pretty fast. Um, I want to ask, by the way, that if you have the possibility and the propensity and all these P words, proclivity to pray, uh, remember tomorrow I am going to be with a, a very influential professional that um, has graced me with a half hour, um, a half hour appointment. And uh, when I originally called his office and spoke to his secretary, two Mondays ago, uh, she, I, I told her who I was and that I had met with him and that he asked me to call and make an appointment. And she said, well, he's kind of booked up for the next couple of months. And I said, I realize he's a very busy person, but he asked for the meeting and asked me to call. And so, you know, yes, sir. You tell me to call Monday morning, I will call Monday morning. And I did. And his secretary said, okay, tell me a bit more. And um, I will speak with him about it and then get back to you. She called me back two days later and said, you want to come on the 31st at two o'clock or on the first at whatever. And we went with tomorrow at two. So uh, if 
you, you know, two o'clock my time. So if you can be in prayer for me that things go well, this could be a very uh, wonderful, important meeting with regard to everything that's going on. Uh, another thing I want to mention to you, another reason that my life is a bit distracted is I do need some prayer, um, some support. Yeah, I, it's Arizona, so I'm in Pacific Daylight Time or Mountain Standard Time and 2 p.m., and it's a 30-minute meeting, and it's going to be really amazing. I, it's, it's, I'll say something about it Wednesday night because I'm sure it's going to be over the top. Um, my friend was running for city council, and he was amazed, saying, wow, uh, how did you get a meeting with him? And so you can imagine, and I mean, I'm dealing with everybody from the president of the Senate, the majority whip, uh, our congressman who on January 6th raised his hand and said, I object the electoral college for Arizona. And I have a Senator Ted Cruz from Texas and the whole thing stopped right there. And all hell broke loose after that. Well, guess what? That's Congressman Paul, Dr. Paul Gosar, who, uh, uh, here, I'll uh, shoot a shot at you uh, if I can get to it quickly. And the point is, uh, I'm, you know, dealing with these people who really uh, have influence in a huge way. And uh, here we go. All right. Look, I'm getting better at pulling things up quickly. Um, gosh, there's so much I, I want to show you here. But I'll just do this much. I said, Congressman Paul Gosar, if you were watching TV that day, he's the one who stopped the whole process. And guess what? Of course, Arizona. Uh, I have a picture of him here. Uh, you can see him speaking right there at the Wesley Bolin Memorial Plaza at 2.34 p.m. December 19th. By the way, that was Saturday. Two days later, he was in the Oval Office uh, in a meeting discussing that was the 21st of January and they were planning the January 6th routine. And here I am with none other than the Paul Gosar and, uh, there's a whole bunch of other important, you know, uh, uh see, there's his, uh, his pin. Um, you know, Oh, I will show you another couple fun shots. Those of you who know Ali, I've shown you these before in the past. Ali Alexander. Um, I may get in all kinds of trouble here. Uh, here's a cool, somebody took this interesting black and white photo. And you see me on the edge here and Paul Gosar and his uh, assistant next to me and Ali on the end and a bunch of other people and my friend Peter on the other end. Very, you know, Weird. Oh yeah. Here's a, a more uh, normal color picture, but I'm not in it because I'm taking it. <laughs> um, but there you see uh, Congressman Gosar and Ali Alexander and the rest of us at the Taco Guild. Uh, that's in downtown Phoenix. We had two dinners that night. Um, of course, that's what happens, right? In these political things, you end up in hotels with people having dinners. This was a really great shot. This is at 9:35 p.m. on December 19th. And um, there's a whole bunch of the people that were at this event that happened um, in Phoenix. Uh, and I will show you one shot of that so that you do see uh, the crowds and the event. Oh, I might want to show you this picture since it's kind of fun. I got a couple pictures. Let's see. All right. It's show and tell time, I guess. Uh, there's uh, Ali Alexander. Doesn't he look like Sammy Davis Jr.? Uh, look, I got a, a, how exciting. Yep. It definitely was very high, uh, intensity. Here's, uh, NTD. I'm always telling you about the new Tang dynasty interviewing him. It is an organization of Chinese Americans who are very pro America. And you see they're interviewing Ali. I won't tell you why. I don't want to get in more craziness and you see more of the 
There's all kinds of stuff going on here, but I do have a very talk about cool, exciting pictures. Uh, let me get one where you see the crowds. Uh, here's one of them. I don't know how many, how many there are to, uh, this is video. And so you can kind of see all the people and the TV folks and, uh, yeah, that's, there's a, a lot of stuff going on here, but there were, I think, but uh, close to 3000 people at this thing. There's uh, Congressman Gosar speaking, and this is December 19th. So, uh, boy, I, there's so much more that I, I get carried away with, but I just want you to see that. Let me see. Is there any other important uh, cool stuff? Because I could get in all kinds of trouble here for different reasons. Um, yeah, I'm. Oh, yeah. If you remember this, let me see if I can back that up. Let me see. Okay. Is this going to show? Yeah, there you go. Uh, again, you've got all of the uh, the press. Oh, no, this is not the one that I was looking for. But you got the idea. And uh, right there in the red, that's uh, the um, – uh, oh, man, now I'm blank on her name. Oh, yeah, here's another one. Okay, he is one of the uh, Arizona senators. I have it on silent, and I guess I could go ahead and put the sound on for a second. Our governor the other day, his office tweeted out something uh, uh, disparaging to Congressman Andy Biggs. And in that tweet, it was, uh, they, they said, uh, the, the person that tweeted out, which was his chief of staff. Um, I guess I cut it off there. But anyway, uh, everybody was there. You know, this was one of those uh, 2,500, 2,000, two, 3,000 people meetings. And there was a lot going on. And like I said, we're having dinner. And then two days later, you know, the guy I'm with is in the Oval Office planning stuff. So that's definitely uh, interesting and exciting and high level. And so I say tomorrow, there's another one of those things coming up. And it's a completely different thing. Very different level, but absolutely in a certain way as serious uh, as any of this other stuff. So, um, and that's about as serious as a heart attack. So I was getting carried away here asking for uh, prayer initially, and uh, I I'm trying to be selective here what I'm going to talk about. Um, there was somebody today on Newsmax that said that, uh, and she is uh, Afghani, and said, suddenly everything changed. I thought maybe everything is okay. Something happened so quickly, and that's what I say. I call that a predatory strike. Okay. And she was very upset. Um, and uh, fortunately she's in the U S um, there was another quote from representative Ronnie Jackson that said, bad things going to happen on national security. Okay. Um, now what we're going to see tonight is in Leviticus 26, lowering the boom. This is where God lowers the boom. And simply by, quote, allowing the negative volition of the people in the land, end quote. Our land and others. So there's a lot going on. Um, I heard Nigel Farage speak. And of course, if you know of him from England, he said the EU and Great Britain you know, they have uh, quite a dismay with everything that's going on. They're very upset. And he said, because this was wonderful, he said, not so much the American people, but our government. Remember how a lot of times we say, oh, we may not like a particular, let's call it a country. And then we all of a sudden say, well, oh, no, no, we don't mean the people. We love the people and, and we know they like us and all that, but it's the government that's a problem. Okay, you know how we have that sometimes with different countries? And this is kind of what he was saying. Okay, so um, I want to 
also point out, and we're going to see it in Leviticus, note the natural or weather phenoms. And you can pray for the others and the U.S. Okay, there are things going on everywhere. And just by listening a little bit and watching news and you hear about strange things like uh, no power in Louisiana for the next three weeks. Okay, so it's hot and humid, it's muggy and wet and weird. And uh, the reporter was saying that AT&T and Verizon are down. And uh, by the way, the levees, they were holding up, but they need power. I don't know how levees work, but apparently uh, they hold back water and they need power and they probably have amounts of letting water through and all that, that again, it takes power to do it. So think about the generator capabilities that are involved and how the Army Corps of Engineers and whoever else, excuse me, I'm having a little bit of uh, sinus activity, but I'm doing pretty well overall. We got lots of flowers. I got to take pictures of all the wildflowers around here. Believe it, it's uh, summer in the mountains, so it, it's almost like spring for some reason, and with all the rain we've had. Uh, and so again, talk about all the rain. Uh, the, that's the worst rain and hurricane issues, plus or minus, in 30 years. And of course, they go back to talking about the, the different really bad ones that we've had in the past 5, 10, 15 years. Um, I want to add, and again, we're going to see this in Leviticus 26. Uh, here we go. They need to run pumps. Yeah, see, that's why I said they can control what the water does, you know, whether they pump it back on the right side or if they maybe let it over or whatever. I don't know how they deal with those levees. And, uh, but that's again, you know, part of the deal and everything gets difficult. By the way, stay supplied. Make sure you have many things, whatever you need, because if we go off grid and things get ugly, you're going to say, man, I wish I would have listened to Philippe over that year and a half that he kept saying, you know, be organized. You know, do what you got to do. All right. Um, I also realize. I don't know who's watching that may have been involved in this or we'll catch it later because I've had a bunch of people call or text or whatever, and I haven't been able to get back to them just yet. So uh, sorry, I've been swamped here. But um, again, I'm dealing with all these interesting things, meetings where people are talking about preparedness and uh, what to do and who can do what and how we can work together. And it can get very extensive. I should mention to you that. Uh, there are preparedness groups all around the country. So wherever you are, you can find them. And uh, I think if you just Google, you know, preparedness group in my county, because I think they have what they call CPT, Community Preparedness Training, CPT, Charlie Papa Tango. So, um, you know, I'm involved with various groups in that way we can take care of each other and do well individually. So, but again, I appreciate your prayers and your patience. Now, how about all this, okay? We're flying in people that we don't know much about and we find out while they're on the plane on their way over here, as well as we have incoming uh, at the Southern border. So think about that issue and what could happen. And there's things I, like I said, I don't want to discuss um, on this type of venue. Um, you may also want to look up survival manuals and uh, groups. Again, I already mentioned some of it about the groups uh, to get various materials, but it's kind of late. And so I did, uh, I did grab a particular uh, little, booklet, Self-Reliance Awareness and Prepping. And um, and this is an old thing, but it says prepping, it's not for doomsday, it's for every day. And this was from a couple of years back, but it's basically a manual that has lots of 
information about, you know, what do you need and what kinds of things can you do to be better prepared? You know, it's kind of interesting, all these groups, they have a zillion different things that they're involved in. Uh, Here's a, a book that if you remember the old Kinko's that went out of business, um, they had a disaster recovery handbook, complete guide to disaster recovery and prevention. Kinko's of San Diego and blah, blah, blah provided this. And it's a very extensive book, including having, um, uh, what do you call them? Forms and stuff from insurance companies and, you know, things that you got to go through when you're, and, you know, stuff for people to know what it's all about when they have problems. And so I have a lot of these kinds of things and have done a lot of this preparation uh, over the years. Um, Here was an interesting one that was on our chairs. There was a group that met up EMP Shield, uh, Home Protection for uh, and to Surpass All Military EMP Standards, um, Electromagnetic Pulse. A lot of people uh, have no clue that things can go wrong and all of a sudden they can be real miserable. So you got to be prepared. Sheesh, I got to keep moving here. Um, Okay, uh, last point here. Many things in the scriptures seem, and I put the quotes here, seem not to make a whole lot of sense as we're reading them sometimes. Again, that's why we get into exegesis here. Truth be told, if each of those things was properly exegeted for you, each thing would start to make a whole lot of sense. And and that's why I say uh, people can have Bibles and read them till they're blue in the face. They can be involved in all kinds of, uh, let's call it extraneous activities and false uh, teaching, you know, uh, there are different levels of truth being taught in, in different cases. You're going to see tonight, we're going pretty deep here. Uh, why don't I just cut to the chase here and get right to our text, Leviticus 26 verse one. Um, in my new American standard, there are sections that breaks down verses one and two Uh, are about these six different conditions of blessing and warnings of chastisement. And it starts with the law of the land. So we're just going to go ahead and you're going to see, I'm going to do this quite quickly. Um, It's going to take a little while because there are 46 verses, but it's really important. So let's start with Leviticus 26 verses one and two. You shall not make for yourselves idols nor shall you set up for yourselves an image or a, quote, sacred pillar, nor shall you place a figured stone in your land to bow down to it, for I am the Lord your God. It's kind of like the Ten Commandments. What's the first one? You know, I am the Lord your God. Verse two, you shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. Now, another thing I want to mention, this is Old Testament. This is all about the the way to execute the Mosaic law. So in other words, the law that Moses came down with the tablets, with the Ten Commandments, and the Levites became the priests of Israel, and they were to administer the teachings, the theological training in what started out with a portable church, a tabernacle that went with them everywhere they went. And then they worshiped and then they would keep moving. You know, there's that joke about uh, why do the Jews never take their hat off? You know, uh, have you ever heard that expression? How come Jews never uh, take off their hat? And the answer is because they never stay somewhere long enough. It's kind of a Jewish joke, I guess. So um, this look, the whole book, the third book of the Pentateuch. So you have uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and then you have Numbers and Deuteronomy. 
the Pentateuch, the five books of the Bible, um, of the Hebrew Bible. They also call that those five books. Uh, it's the Pentateuch. And another word for it is the um, Torah, the law, because Torah has to do with law. And so it says most scholars studying the first five books of the Bible either attempt to dissect it into uh, various pre-Pentateuchal documents or at the very least analyze Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy as separate self-contained documents. The Pentateuch as narrative focuses on the narrative and literary continuity of the Pentateuch as a whole. It seeks to disclose how the original Jewish readers may have viewed this multi-volume work of Moses. Uh, its central thesis is that the Pentateuch was written from the perspective of one who had lived under the law of the covenant, established at Mount Sinai, and had seen its failure to produce genuine trust in the Lord God of Israel. In this context, the Pentateuch pointed the reader forward to the hope of the new covenant based on divine faithfulness. So uh, this particular text, and do you notice that the, the font on it is kind of like the writing on our money? You know, $1, it's using that font. And it's kind of interesting. So anyway, um, yeah, this book breaks down things like wilderness wanderings, you know, and so it's, in, in this case, uh, it's in Exodus. And so it says from Exodus 15, 22 to 1827, and then it shows interesting charts like this, you know, showing uh, about the manna quail and the 40 years and where it would be in Exodus and in numbers and in, uh, what is that, uh, Joshua? Is that what it is, 512? and so on and so forth. So um, tonight we're in one of those chapters. And what I'm trying to do by just showing you a certain amount from that, you're going to see how the Jews were supposed to live. But then why is that still relevant to us? Well, we are still, wherever the New Testament refers to the Old Testament, we're still connected to the Old Testament and things that it teaches us still apply in the New Testament. And that means they apply in the church age, which means they apply now. Okay. So uh, that all said, let's keep reading. We're going to look now at starting at verse three through verse 13, conditions of blessing. Uh, you're going to see how our country meets some of those conditions and why we have been a blessed nation. Uh, in God we trust, it even says on those bills. Verse three, if you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments so as to carry them out, verse four, then I shall give you rains in their season so that the land will yield its produce and the trees of the field will bear their fruit. Verse five, indeed, your threshing will last for you until grape gathering, and grape gathering will last until sowing time. You will thus eat your food to the full and live securely in your land. Verse six, I shall also grant peace in the land so that you may lie down, as in when you go to sleep, with no one making you tremble. Ah, so if you're not doing that, that means you're going to lie down and tremble and you're not going to sleep well. Anybody having problems? Uh, continuing verse six, I shall also eliminate harmful beasts from the land and no sword will pass through your land. Now those beasts represented danger and death, okay? They didn't have tanks. They didn't have Apache helos. They didn't have drones. They didn't have all kinds of things, grenade launchers, IEDs, you name it. Those are beasts today. So in verse six, continuing, and no sword will pass through your land. Verse seven, by the way, that's the military, of course, uh, enemies. Uh, that is coming. Verse seven, but you will chase your enemies and they will fall before you by the sword. Verse eight, 
five of you will chase a hundred and a hundred of you will chase 10,000 and your enemies will fall before you by the sword. In other words, we'll be whooping them. Verse nine, so I will turn toward you and make you fruitful, turn toward you, notice, I will turn toward you and make you fruitful and multiply you and I will confirm my covenant with you. That has been the story of manifest destiny in these United States, starting on the East Coast, somewhere in the 15, 1600s, even 1492 and all that, whatever that people want to argue about at this point. Verse 10, and you will eat the old supply. That means all the goodies that you have in the pantry and clear out the old because of the new. There will be so much new coming in. You'll have, oh, I think this is old. I'll check it. You know, in the trash it goes. Okay, verse 11, moreover, I will make my dwelling among you. Uh-oh, I just noticed something. Let me check. I did not do this on my checklist. <laughs> That's great. Guess what, uh, Leonard? I didn't check it, but somehow it made the 5G, the, uh, what do you call that? The default. And so if you've noticed, we haven't had any problem uh, so far. And I was just thinking, uh Oh, I better check and make sure we're on 5g. Anyway, that was, a another intercalation. I had to throw that in. All right. So anyway, continuing, uh, let's, let's do verse 11 again. Moreover, I will make my dwelling among you. And the word for dwelling is, you know, a tabernacle. I will tabernacle with you. The technical word, you can look it up in the dictionary but I will dwell with you. I will be with you. We will be together. That idea. And my soul will not, now the word in the New American Standard, reject you. Reject literally in Hebrew is the word for abhor. And I will not abhor you. And that's the first time that comes up. Verse 12, I will also walk among you and be your God and you shall be my people. And even the my is capitalized, which is amazing, capital M. I will be your God and you shall be my people. So it's my God speaking, saying, you are mine. Ah, yeah, Leonard just put in a note saying that uh, the, everything's been good. Uh, we're being blessed. Thank you, Lord. It's Leviticus 26. And right now in the reading, we're still in the blessing part. So that's nice. But we're, it's going to get ugly. Uh, in fact, it's getting ready to do so here in a second. So verse 12, I will also walk among you and um, be your God and you shall be my people, capital M. 13, I am the Lord, your God. And Lord there is the Tetragrammaton, uh, yod He bav He. The reason we know is when you see Lord written this way, uh, where my finger is there. Let me see if I can straighten that out. The Lord is... B capital L, but then look, the O, R, and D are small caps. I am, you know, they would say Adonai. And it's the word we would use for when they'd say Yahweh or uh, Jehovah or whatever. But the Jews would never say that. And they just say, um, I am Adonai. I am the Lord. And it's capital L, and then small capitals, O-R-D. I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt so that you should not be their slaves. And I broke the bars of your yoke, not as in an egg, Y-O-L-K, but Y-O-K-E, and made you walk erect. All right, so upright and upright in standing, right? So, um... Now we get to national discipline, warnings of chastisement, and that is going to be verses 14 and 15 introduction. And then we get the first chastisement, verses 16 and 17. So beginning with our warnings of chastisement, verse 14, but, which is a conjunction of contrast. If you do not obey me and do not carry out all these commandments, verse 15, if instead you reject my statutes and if your soul rejects my ordinances, and again, the word there is abhor, and that, that's our idea of rejecting, reject my ordinances 
So as not to carry out all my capital M there, my commandments, and so break my capital N, uh, M covenant, then here we go. This is the first of five cycles of discipline, the first of five chastisements. Verse 16, then, you know, from if you do all, uh, you don't carry out my commandments and break my covenant, I, verse 16, I in turn will do this to you. First of five cycles of discipline. I will appoint over you a sudden terror, consumption and fever that shall waste away the eyes and cause the soul to pine away. Now, let's talk about terror and terrorists. And even 9-11 is an example, but there have been many even before that. That was a big one. And then when it talks about fever, okay, no, we're not talking 2019, 2020. We're not talking about this blurb. How about those other ones that come and they cause all kinds of trouble? SARS, this one, and this, and that thing, and all those different, you know, bugs that we've had. So remember, this is 19, as they call it, uh, and Delta variant and so on. There have been a bunch of them. So when it says, uh, and fever that shall waste away the eyes and cause the soul to pine away. Also, you shall sow your seed uselessly, for your enemies shall eat it up. Okay, so we're getting hints of famine. 17, and I will set my face against you so that you shall be struck down before your enemies and those who hate you shall rule over you and you shall flee when no one is persecuting or pursuing you, I should say. You shall flee when no one is pursuing you. Hmm. There's a lot of ways to read that, but that's only first chastisement or first cycle of discipline. Second cycle, drought, verses 18 through 20. Also, it says, if also after these things you do not obey me, then I will punish you, here we go, seven times more for your sins. So what we're saying is the first cycle of discipline was bad. This, now the, watch how this progresses. This is seven times worse. I will punish you seven times more for your sins, verse 19. And I will also break down your pride of power. I will also make your sky like iron and your earth like bronze. Okay, and so what that has to do with um, is it's, it's shutting everything off. And we're going to see more about all this iron and bronze as we keep going. So I won't, I won't par park here and, and uh, elaborate on it. Verse 20. And your strength shall be spent uselessly, for your land shall not yield its produce, and the trees of the land shall not yield their fruit. Okay, so there's where drought kicks in big time. And we're all noticing that in these United States in particular, there are lots of problems, and particularly with the states that produce so much produce, right? California um, in the Midwest and places like Iowa and Ohio and all those states down the line in the middle there that have so many farms and so much produce. And also, here we go, watch this. Um, third chastisement. Um, let me see, did I read enough of this? Well, Verse 20, and your strength shall be spent uselessly for your land shall not yield its produce and the trees of the land shall not yield their fruit. Verse 21, here it is about the beasts. If then you act with hostility against me and are unwilling to obey me, I will increase the plague on you seven times according to your sins. So here we go. It's a third level. The first one was level one discipline. The second one was 
second level and seven times worse. Now the third one is third level and seven times worse than the last one. And it says, according to your sins. Verse 22, and I will let loose among you the beasts of the field, which shall bereave you of your children and destroy your cattle and reduce your number so that your roads lie deserted. Okay, that's third level, third cycle of discipline. And I have charts on this and we could call this uh, economic trouble. And here comes the fourth one, okay? Military, this includes military invasion. So uh, fourth chastisement, disease. Now, when I said notice it includes military, what do you think this plague is about? Remember when I mentioned, and I have a military background, and it's military intelligence, it's cryptology, it's, you know, National Security Agency, Naval Security Group, um, a whole bunch of stuff about all of that. Well, we'll talk about it. Let's read verses 23, 4, 5, and 6, and then a quick blurb. If, let's see, and so a fourth cycle of discipline, and if... By these things, you are not turned to me, but act with hostility against me. So you're still, you know, rebelling. Verse 24, then I will act with hostility against you. And I, even I, will strike you seven times for your sins. So now we're on the fourth cycle of discipline. It's gotten seven times worse than the first and the second, seven times worse than the second and the third. And now even seven times worse in the fourth. Verse 25, I will also bring upon you a sword which will execute vengeance for the covenant. And when you gather together in your cities, I will send pestilence among you so that you shall be delivered into enemy hands. Verse 26, when I break your staff of bread, and there's a whole bunch on this that we're not gonna have time to get into. Um, 10 women will bake your bread in one oven and they will bring back your bread in rationed amounts so that you will eat and not be satisfied. In other words, you'll want two pieces of toast or three and only get a half a piece and you'll still be hungry, okay? So you will eat and not be satisfied. And where it says... Uh, they will bring back your bread in rationed amounts. It literally means by weight in Hebrew, a little bit. And if I go to Psalm 105, 16, uh, which I can do real quickly because it's page 830. See, I have all the pages listed so I can get to them pretty quick. And in that case, I'll go ahead and read. In Psalm 105, verse 16, it says, and he, meaning capital H, God, called for a famine upon the land. He broke the whole staff of bread. Okay. And if we go to um, Isaiah 3, verse 1, and that's on 928. Isaiah 3, 1, you're going to notice this terminology. For behold, the Lord God of hosts is going to remove from Jerusalem and Judah both supply and support, the whole supply of bread and the whole supply of water. Okay, so we're talking real problems. And if you know anything about Isaiah, uh, Isaiah was the weeping prophet along with Jeremiah. Uh, these guys really had it bad. And then Jeremiah also wrote Lamentations. And I could keep going. I will tell you in case you want to write it down and go look at uh, also Ezekiel 4.16. And uh, so verses 16 and 17. And then also uh, Ezekiel 5.16. And then there's also Micah 6.14 and Haggai 1.6. 
when people like to say Haggai, but it's H-A-G-G-A-I. So however people want to pronounce that. So why did I mention all of these? Because they all talk about this business of the bread. Let me go to uh, 1118 and I'll read that one, which is Ezekiel 4, 16 and 17. So Ezekiel 4, 16 and 17. And I'm going to read you this, the two verses. You'll see it's the same problem. It says, Ezekiel 4, 16 and 17. Moreover, he said to me, son of man, behold, I am going to break the staff of bread in Jerusalem and they will eat bread by weight and with anxiety and drink water by measure and in horror. Verse 17. And because bread and water will be scarce and they will be appalled with one another and waste away in their iniquity. Did you happen to hear how much uh, a little whatever canteen of water was costing in Kabul? Did you hear? I did. 400 American or US dollars for water and same price for a, a bowl of rice. I'm not exaggerating. I'm not kidding. It's exactly what I saw. And I've got a lot of stuff. I wish I could show it all to you. That's why I'm keeping busy. I'm in the middle of all this. All right. Got to keep reading. Um, so, so as it says there in verse 26, so we're Leviticus 26, 26. When I break your staff of bread, 10 women will bake your bread in one oven and they will bring back your bread by weight, rationed amounts, so that you will eat and not be satisfied. Satisfied. Here comes the fifth cycle of discipline, famine. Verse 27, and this is going to be 27 through 31. Yet if in spite of this, you do not obey me, but act with hostility against me. Verse 28. Then I will act with wrathful hostility against you, and I, even I, will punish you seven times for your sins. Okay, that's the fifth time with the fifth five cycles of discipline. This is seven times worse than the fourth, which was seven times worse than the third, which was seven times worse than the second, which was seven times worse than the first. Okay, it's getting really difficult. Now, if you look at what's happening to Americans, U.S. citizens like yourselves, and if anybody's international watching, um, U.S. citizens in Afghanistan right now, some of them are sweating it in a lot of different ways. And you can see all this going on. So let's keep reading verse 29. Further. You shall eat the flesh of your sons and the flesh of your daughters you shall eat. Verse 30, I then will destroy your high places, the Asherim. Um, I will cut down your incense altars and heap your remains on the remains of your idols. For my soul shall, here's the word again, abhor you. Verse 31, I will lay waste your cities you know, give desolation to your cities as well and will make your sanctuaries desolate and I will not smell your soothing aromas. There won't be any. And that was part of the incense, the censers at the temple um, or at the tabernacle when they were the wandering Jews in the desert. All right, that's the fifth cycle of discipline, verses 27 to 31. Now, amazingly, if that weren't bad enough, the five cycles of discipline, there is a sixth deal. And that is not really a fifth cycle of discipline. It is a sixth cycle that you could call total destruction. Uh, the English word is dispersion. So it means destruction and, you know, a diaspora. They're all sent out. That's why the Jews are all over the world. And you can compare this where we are at verses 32 to the end, 46. 
You can also see it in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 58 to 67. Again, Deuteronomy 28, 58 to 67. So let's see what this part says. And I'll try to read through this. I can see at least one spot where I may want to stop. But other than that, I'm going to just try to read. Okay. Leviticus 26, 32 through 46. 32. And I will make the land desolate, desolate so that your enemies who settle in it shall be appalled over it. 33. You, however, I will scatter among the nations and will draw out a sword after you as your land becomes desolate and your cities become waste. 34. New paragraph. Then the land will enjoy its Sabbaths, which it did not. All the days of the desolation, while you are in your enemy's land, then the land will rest and enjoy its Sabbaths. These are these literally satisfy the Sabbaths that the Lord had required of them that they didn't do. 35, all the days of its desolation, it will observe the rest which it did not observe on your Sabbaths while you were living on it. In other words, he's chewing them out for what they didn't do, that they were supposed to do. 36, as for those of you who may be left, the remnant, which we call today and in America, it's the pivot of mature believers. I will also bring weakness into their hearts in the lands of their enemies. And the sound of a driven leaf will chase them. And even when no one is pursuing, they will flee as though from the sword and they will fall. Verse 37, therefore, they will therefore stumble over each other as if running from the sword, although no one is pursuing. And you will have no strength to stand up before your enemies. Verse 38, but you will perish among the nations and your enemies' land will consume you. Does that sound like the history of the Jews? Verse 39. So those of you who may be left will rot away because of their iniquity in the lands of your enemies and also because of the iniquities of their forefathers, they will rot away with them. Pause here to say that at the end, you're going to see that the Lord doesn't forget his covenant to the Jews. And so here we go, starting at verse 40. The Abrahamic covenant remains despite the disobedience and despite this dispersion, the diaspora, the famous since uh, Titus and the Roman legions, A.D. 70, approximately August of A.D. 70. So 70 years after, let's call it the birth of Christ, when Christ said that this would happen, that the the temple would be torn down and that not one stone you know above the other would remain except on the wailing wall of course um so here verse 40 if they confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their forefathers in their unfaithfulness which they committed against me and also in their acting with hostility against me Verse 41, I also was acting with hostility against them to bring them into the land of their enemies or if their uncircumcised heart becomes humbled so that they then make amends for their iniquity. Verse 32, here's a big one. Then I will remember my covenant with Jacob and I will remember also my covenant with Isaac and my covenant with Abraham as well. Remember, it's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Here it's got it in reverse order from the younger to the first son to uh, Abraham as well. And I will remember the land. So there's hope in that one verse, Leviticus 26, 42. And it continues. For the land shall be abandoned by them and shall make up for its Sabbaths while it is made desolate without them. They meanwhile shall be making amends for their iniquity because they rejected my ordinances and their soul abhorred my statutes. 44. Yet in spite of this, when they are in the land of their enemies, I will not reject them, nor will I so abhor them as to destroy them, breaking my covenant, my covenant with them. 
for I am the Lord, their God. Verse 45, but I will remember them, the covenant with their answer, or I will remember for them the covenant with their ancestors whom I brought out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the nations that I might be their God. I am the Lord. And finally, the end, verse 36. These are the statutes and ordinances and laws which the Lord established between himself and the sons of Israel through Moses at Mount Sinai. Now, I wish I could go on uh, in more detail about all this. But what I want to say is this country being like Israel, being a client nation to God, okay? And it started with Israel. And then the Israel was, of course, the, the holy land and the people of God. When this all kind of went down and the historical diaspora, the dispersion of all the Jews who were together in their own land. And since that time, August of 70 AD, Titus and the Roman legions have dispersed all over the world. And at that moment, Israel was no longer the client nation to God. It's still God's people. But Israel became, let's call it a no man's land. And they're always fighting over it still to this day. But guess what? After that very moment, we have the first client nation, Gentile client nation, and that's Rome, SPQR, Senatus Populusque Romanus. And the people and the, uh, or I should say, um, the Senate and the people of Rome, Senatus Populusque Romanus, SPQR. That became the first Gentile client nation to God. There have been a ton of them, you know, a bunch of them traveling to the West up until a couple hundred years ago, where it finally went across the pond, as they say, especially in, in England, across the pond to our nation, the United States of America, the current client nation to God. And we are God's uh, not chosen people. We are his current client nation, and therefore responsible to spread the gospel and the good news of evangelism to all nations and to be a haven for the Jews. Now, part of the battle that's going on right now in the Middle East, in, in all those different countries, and if you look at the map where you really see where Afghanistan is, um, it's involving the king of the north, Russia. It's involving the king of the east, China. Um, it, the whole area is a quagmire right now. And we're going to see things that we don't want to see happen. So, like I said, be ready. Look at me. I always have my little bottle here. I didn't bring out the others. Do I have them on the table over there? I can't see them. I don't think they're there. I think I put them away. Hmm. Hold on. Maybe one of them is there. Yep. Essential oils and other goodies like eating good food, exercising, sleeping, whatever. Uh, if you get such things as this, you'll be doing yourself a favor. Why? I don't get money for telling about this. I get nothing. I just have good health. I have been ingesting, this is my own uh, little bottle that I keep in my pocket, um, and I add orange oil to it. And I've been ingesting all this stuff for over 20 years. And so I've noticed I don't get a cold, I don't get a sore throat, I don't get the flu, and I don't get anything else. That's what I can say about it. Um, you really need, I do have, uh, like we saw, uh, allergy, sinus, blah, blah. Uh, we got a lot of flowers right now. Maybe on Wednesday, if I have pictures, if I take some pictures, you'll see the wildflowers. Um, and so uh, I just 
have occasional allergy things that I can fix, just like I fix everything else with this kind of stuff. Um, and so you need to do everything you can to do well. So our inner intercalation tonight, what meaneth this? Leviticus 26 and some ideas. Um, if you can already see by what we've discussed tonight, um, parallels to this exegetical chapter that, I mean, it's so amazing. There's so much going on here that you can make analogies and pull from it. Unfortunately, uh, we don't have the time to do the details, but if I were to just say that in the first cycle of discipline, let me see if I can get one of those charts. I've got a chart on it. So how fast can I pull this up? This is going to be a good exercise. Um, let me see. I think. Okay. Uh, I should be able to pull what I need up here. Yep. Oh, wow. This is great. Uh, I do have a an image. And I'm going to pull it up for you. And uh, let me move it over to the right window. Come on. Let's see, where are we? Are we here? I hope I got it. Yep, I did it. I did it right. All right, let me pull something up for you to see. And this is uh, thanks to a couple of people. Originally, the Colonel, R.B. Theme Jr., and uh, Joe Griffin also, um, in fact, this is his little version. Um, and let me see, I don't think it gets any bigger. Yeah, when I do this, it just centers it. But take a look there. You see, um, first cycle, loss of health. Oh, by the way, let's read it. The five cycles of discipline to client nations, Leviticus 26, 14 through 39. Now, in verses 14 through 17, we see the first cycle, loss of health, decline of agricultural prosperity, terror, fear, and death in combat, loss of personal freedoms due to negative volition toward Bible doctrine. Second cycle, verses 18 through 20, economic recession and depression, increased personal and individual discipline for continued negative volition in spite of the first warning. Third cycle, violence and breakdown of law and order, severe restriction of travel and commerce, verses 21 and 22. Fourth cycle, military conquest and or foreign occupation, scarcity of food uh, reduced to one-tenth the normal supply. Uh, separation of families, verses 23 through 26. Fifth cycle, Destruction of the nation due to maximum rejection of Bible or biblical principles, verses 27 to 39. Okay, now, uh, that's coming from one of the colonel's books, Freedom Through Military Victory, fourth edition. And, um, and then also there are um, notes I guess uh, it'll suffice to just say that if you were to get the Freedom Through Military Victory book, uh, you'll be able to, to get all that. Okay, and I have that book right here just to show it to you. And so you can get Freedom Through Military Victory. And this is an old version of it here. And so um, there's a whole lot more information you can get all that, on all this. But the reason that I brought it up tonight is because we're getting ready to really feel the heat. And I wanted you to know that it's going to be okay, individually anyhow. It might be okay for you. It might be okay for me. Um, it might not be. And that's why I wrote on one of those tweets that uh, some people are not surviving this. 
You know, unfortunately, not everyone will survive. So um, it is hectic already. And we have obviously had the problem of, you know, a, um, a terror type situation. We've had casualties. And 24 hours from now, a whole new uh, game begins. And it's going to get thick, right? So I'm glad I have my meeting tomorrow before the end of the day. Um, because I don't know if that meeting would be pulled off later. Uh, it may become too difficult. And by Wednesday night, I'll be able to explain, uh, I, what I say now will make more sense to you and I'll explain the details. So again, the inner, uh, callation that we did tonight, the real deal here, what meaneth this? Um, we're looking at the fact that the nation is already in a military quagmire. And we're going to have, as I had mentioned before, with World War III uh, in progress, more battles and more things happening. Just as I have said in the past, do your due diligence and be sober. That doesn't mean you can't you know, have a couple beers or glasses of wine or some shots of whiskey or whatever it is that some people do. Uh, I realized that nowadays I'd have to add all the other junk. But the bottom line is, um, and the Bible says, you know, be sober, think, you know, objectively, have your faculties with you because you're going to need to be able to think. Okay. So um, we're going to close with that and have a moment of closing prayer. Uh, as I have always mentioned at the end of our meetings, uh, the prayer board, think about how important it is now intercession to be praying for everybody from pastors, government, law enforcement, military, uh, and their families and special services personnel, uh, illnesses and other needs, uh, pastors at large, the students, I don't know what's going to be happening here as we all have seen lately with schools. Um, and my petition is, you know, that I'm keeping busy and I'm being distracted. Uh, my mom has been having some difficulties. So you can pray when you pray for me that, uh, mom and I are doing, you know, organized and doing well together to do what we need to do. Uh, it's taking up more time, uh, for me. I need to, you know, help her out extra. And so I'm, I'm focusing on our get togethers on Mondays and Wednesdays and m myself, of course, and mom and all that in mind with trying to make sure that, uh, I am in fellowship so that I have my, uh, vertical relationship in order and then horizontal with you guys. So thanks for being here. I don't know what happened to some of the people who's still here or not. I can't tell. But um, yeah, thank you, uh, Leonard. Um, she's doing okay, but it's difficult. You know, she's having to deal with um, things, you know, what to do with different things. So there's nothing exactly specific. Uh, you can pray that she continues to have the best health possible, but that as she is, um, you know, up there in years, um, a lot of changes are happening. I may get her up here. And that may be really great, right? It'd be a good thing. She won't be able to stay with me because I take up the whole place here. In an emergency, it's no sweat. I can go get her and the pup and we're good to go. But we're trying to get organized and um, I think she's going to stop driving um, pretty much. And, you know, I mean, that was going to happen by March anyway. Her lease was going to be up and I don't know what we were going to do. We decided to lease a car for three years. And so since she'll be 88 on Pearl Harbor Day, that's like one year for every note on the piano. It's kind of cool. Um, you know, we're, we're doing what, what we need to, I guess, is the point. So I'm working on all these serious things. And it goes to show you, the Lord always has a plan for our lives. And it's wonderful because he's graced us out with many blessings. And even as all hell breaks loose out there, we can still have a great day and be encouraged and encourage each other and go for it. So 
how about we close in prayer on that note and, uh, you know, propose meeting on Wednesday night and continue in Philemon. And hopefully we'll do okay on Wednesday. All right. Uh, so let's uh, have a moment of prayer. Let us pray. We thank you now, Heavenly Father, in closing uh, for a very good review of a most serious subject. The fact that you want to have a great relationship with us and be our God and bless us. That is the whole sum total answer. We don't need all the other stuff. We don't need all the negative. Actually, the only reason it needs to be there is to tell us, hey, if we get on the wrong side of the track, uh, it's not going to be good for us. And that's why you want us to stay in line with you, to stay in fellowship and to have a relationship with you and be blessed. So we thank you for that privilege and thank you for your love and the fact that you are love. And uh, we can't say that. God can say, I am love, period. Turns love into a um, an intransitive and it, it doesn't need an object. There's no I love dash, dash, dash. It's just I am love. None of us can say that, only God. So we thank you, God, that that is one of your attributes. Love It's one of the 10 things in the essence box. And the fact that you love us and that because of that, we can love you. And because of that, you said, uh, love the Lord your God and love your neighbor. And so all of a sudden we can love others. Amazing concept. If only the world had that as a priority, we'd be having none of these issues. But that's not the angelic conflict. So here we are. So we thank you for your provisions. We thank you again that we have a wall of fire around us. If we stay in fellowship, we have absolutely nothing to fear of making wrong decisions and being at the wrong place at the wrong time. So help us to be in your will. And I thank you for everybody that got to hear any of this tonight. And I hope that more people will get to, and I hope that it will be a blessing, a source of blessing and challenge in our lives. And we ask all these things, B'Shem Yeshua HaMashiach, in Christ's name, amen. And voila, an exegetical intercalation. That's a mouthful, huh? And yeah, you know, I, I do have some vocabulary. I always joke and say, if you think I talk a lot, I'm only talking in one language for the most part. So think about it if I... Si je commençais à parler en français or uh, entonces en espanol, podemos hablar en espanol también. So, oh, I missed the other one, the amen. Yeah, thank you, Leonard. You're always a breath of fresh air and a, you know, a source of encouragement and a friend and everybody else that gets to watch. Oh, I see there are some other people watching, uh, coming and going on uh, YouTube. Please, anybody who's on there and uh, didn't catch the whole thing, please do a replay and watch it because we covered a lot of stuff and hopefully you'll be encouraged to know that the God of the universe is on our side. He wants to be with us. He does not want us to be separated. So uh, on that note, I salute you and thank you for being a part of the team. And I want, again, to encourage you that we will do well. Yay. All right. Thank you. And seriously, uh, we're a team. So let's stick together. And um, like I said, on Wednesday night, I'll have news from uh, tomorrow's meeting and I'll be able to figure out how much I can lay out, you know, without getting in trouble. What do we have here? All right. Leonard says, good night. So yeah, good night to all and sleep well. Uh, take care of yourselves so that you can be in good shape. All right. Thank you so much and be well, be happy. See you Wednesday. Okay, good night. <laughs>